the original conveners for this year's NZDC conference. Welcome to the second installment of the NZDC 2020 webinar series. Today we will be covering Wellington seismicity. We'll hear about some of the latest research that's happened on the Wellington Basin and the associated seismicity. There are another four webinar, webinars planned in the series, about two weeks apart, between now and early July. These webinars will pick up many of the keynote and invited plenary sessions from the original conference program, along with a selected subset of some of the submitted papers. We'll address issues including damage suffered in Wellington during the Kaikoura earthquake and forward-looking resilience strategies, horizontal and distributed infrastructure, low damage design, and earthquake insurance and loss considerations. We are working with the presenters for the upcoming webinars to finalise the remaining events in the series. Please keep an eye on your email inbox as we release details of the upcoming webinars. We hope that you can join us throughout the series as we explore many of the issues currently facing our profession. We are also in the process of working with a group of young professionals to organise a young professionals event online in lieu of the corresponding event that was originally scheduled during the physical conference last month. We will be announcing more details about this in the near future. I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to all our sponsors, exhibitors and registrants who have offered to donate all or part of their registration or sponsorship fees to help offset the loss to the society as a result of cancelling the conference. A special mention to EQC, who were originally scheduled to be a conference partner and who are now partnering with us to deliver the webinar series. I'd also like to extend a major thanks to our big sponsor, MB Building System Performance, as well as to Taylor Devices, Geostabilisation International, Main Mark, Granol Rubber and Engineering, and Quake Core for their support of the webinar series. Also, a huge thanks to Engineering New Zealand, uh, particularly Rebecca and Holly, for their logistical support in the online webinar series. We're still working on publishing the proceedings of the papers for this conference. Uh, all of the peer review reports were released to submitting authors about two weeks ago, and the revised papers are due today. A reminder to anyone that is still to submit papers to please do so in the near future. Uh, you will notice that this is a little bit high behind the original schedule and that's a result of uh, the, the delays in the peer review process as a result of everyone dealing with the, the implications of COVID. We'll work on the final copy editing and release the full, full proceedings in the near future. During the webinar we will be using Pigeonhole to manage questions. So that is a separate application to Adobe Connect. Uh, so you can open that in a browser on your computer or on your phone and the um, the address is just over to to the right there so it's pigeonhole.at and the event code is nzse2 so uh, even if you don't necessarily have a question you can vote up or vote down question uh, vote up questions that uh, others have asked if you think that's an important question you'd like to see asked so we'll hold questions to the end and ask them once all three speakers have spoken that's about it from me regarding formalities. So I'll now pass over to Chris Van Hout from GNS, who's my co-chair for this particular webinar, and he will induce, uh, introduce the speakers. Hi everyone, I'm Chris, and yeah, I'm helping Jeff to chair the webinar today. So today we have Matt Gerstenberger, Anna Kaiser, and Brendan Bradley talking on Wellington seismicity. And the motivation for this topic is that Wellington's currently a focal point of seismic hazard discourse in New Zealand, with new science emerging on time-dependent earthquake forecasting since the Kaikoura earthquake, improving understanding of the Hikurangi subduction interface, and the local basin amplification effects in Wellington. A lot's changing about how we understand seismic hazard in Wellington and the subsequent risk to the built environment. And it's a curly problem, and we're not here to hear solutions to these problems today, but instead for the presenters to show what's currently known about the underlying seismicity and ground motion effects. And our speakers today to cover this topic are Matt Gerstenberger, Anna Kaiser, and Brendan Bradley. Welcome to you three, and thanks for agreeing to present. So Matt Gerstenberger is a principal scientist at GNS Science. He has experience in earthquake forecasting and seismic hazard analyses, and is currently leading the National Seismic Hazard Model Program. Anna Kaiser is a senior scientist at GNS Science with a wide ranging experience on earthquake sources, path effects and site effects. In the past, you may have also heard her speak countless times on radio and television in her role as a GeoNet duty seismologist. And Brennan Bradley is a professor of earthquake engineering at University of Canterbury and the director of Quake Corp. Brendan has experience across structural and geotechnical engineering, seismic hazard and risk, with a focus nowadays on simulated ground motion data. 
And we'll start with Matt, and as Jeff, Jeff mentioned, rather than Jeff and I interjecting between each presentation, each speaker will pass on to the next, and then we'll have Q&A at the end. So please don't forget to submit your questions through the pigeonhole link. So thanks for joining everyone, and take it away, Matt. Thank you very much, Chris. Let me get my, my camera started here. Um, thanks very much, everyone, for sure sharing your, your lunchtime with me. First off, I'll apologize for my my nose. I found out the, the medical system's working very efficiently during level three, and I got off the wait list and I had surgery all accomplished within two days this week. Um, so what I'm going to discuss today is a bit of overview on where we think some of the main issues are with seismic hazard bottling in general and how we plan to approach those and then go into some specific details um, on the, on the, on the Wellington region. And this is contribution from, from many different people into this um, presentation. Not sure I've got control here. Okay, there we go. So it's working. So just a quick overview for if you're not familiar with, with hazard work that's gone on in the past in New Zealand, it, they kind of entered really the, the seismic hazard mapping modeling world in 1985 with Trevor Matryska's um, map as we see on the left, and then entered the, the modern PSHA era with Mark Sterling's uh, PhD in 1998, and then a revision of that in 2002 that went into NZS 1170, and then a subsequent revision to that in, in 2010. So the 2002 and the 2010 models were, were essentially data updates, so taking on new fault data in the, the GeoNet Earthquake Catalog from the, the same basic methods um, have remained since 1998. Trying to get it to change. Seemed to be not changing well, slowly. Um, so if you're... Um, not familiar, the, the basic components of a seismic hazard model, um, there's really two, two main components the way it usually gets discussed. Um, first, we'll, we'll call the seismicity rate model, and that's, that's the model or the models that you use to, to forecast the locations, the rates, and the magnitudes of the, the earthquakes. This doesn't, doesn't say anything about the ground shaking in this part. Um, these models are made up of earthquake geology information, faults, what we know about them, the GNAT earthquake catalog, and GPS strain rate observations, more recently GPS strain rate observations from the network around the country. Um, the second part is the ground motion characterization model. Um, this probably most people are familiar with in terms of the McVary ground motion predi prediction equation, the GMPE. We tend to call those ground motion models now or GMMs just to indicate that there's, there's been some pretty big changes from the early days of what was happening in GMPEs. Um, and then these, what these do is they take every source within the seismicity rate model and they estimate the, ground, the range of ground motion possible um, given those sources. Um, the third part of the model um, that doesn't really get talked about so much, um, but it's actually a, a key part. It's a bit philosophical, but it's actually a hard-coded part of the model and how you put everything together. And that's the underlying ph philosophy of how you're dealing with uncertainties in the model. So really the question is, or what is, what it's doing is how is the uncertainty in our knowledge of the earthquake occurrence process getting into the model? So what types of uncertainty are we considering? How much uncertainty? Um, and how are we getting that in? And how are we propagating it through the system? Um, in, in, the, in the past, I, mean, I guess this is kind of a schematic of the uncertainty that was considered. It's been pretty much almost entirely on the ground motion characterization side. I've lost the slides. I don't know if others are seeing it. No, it's come back. Um, um, and with very little um, uncertainty considered on the seismicity rate model side. Um, the way things have gone in the last 20 years, it's much larger considerations for the uncertainties, and not just on the ground motion side, but on the seismicity rate model side. Um, and I guess a, a key key point of this is that um, no single submod. So the the national model is really, it's not a model on its own. It's a, it's a collection of a bunch of different models that get put together. So you can, similar to what might happen with climate models, where they have models of a system that they bring together in an ensemble, a difference in what we do with seismic hazard modeling is most of these submodels are just capturing one particular part of the system. They're not trying to capture the whole range of what can go on. Um, but model, model, no one, any one of these models cannot describe what we know. 
Um, so modern hazard modeling methods have really allowed us to be able to include these multiple models into it um, to look at multiple realizations of what, what the, the hazard might look like. And this is what typically gets called epistemic uncertainty, if you're familiar with that term. In the past, uh, the NSHM really only considered a single realization from this whole range of um, possibilities, and it included the uncertainty through the variability, the randomness in a single GMPE, so i.e. such as the log normal distribution of the potential ground motion shaking. Um, and why this becomes important is because the range of these models of scenario is not necessarily symmetric about the whatever the particular metric that you're looking at. Um, so the use impacts then the mean, sometimes a lot, sometimes not really much at all. Um, they affect the shape of whatever distribution you're looking at, and they, they also necessarily affect the range um, in the estimated hazard distribution. So falling on from that, it affects the scenarios of what's considered in the hazard calculation. So what what, what, what sources, what magnitudes, where they are, and, and so on. Um, so the way that works in, in, um, in practice is, I can't get the, the arrow to work here, um, is mechanically the way this works, the most common way is using logic trees. And if you're not familiar with one of those, uh, what they are, really one branch in a logic tree represents one particular scenario. So on the lower left, I have, I have taken a, a, a small section from a logic tree used in a USGS um, seismic hazard model. Um, and this, this shows how you, if you look just at the source model, there's a number of steps of decisions that they make, different options, different scenarios. And then if you take one path through that, that logic tree branch, you get one particular gray curve on the right-hand side. If you take another branch, you get a different curve, gray curve on the right-hand side. And what the right-hand side is showing, this is just purely schematic, um, but on, on the x-axis axis is some random ground motion metric, and on the left is an exceedance probability. And so once you propagate all the way through the different branches on the logic tree, you end up with a range of curves. Whereas in the past, we would have had just a single single curve. I call it the mean here, but we really, in the past, we can't really say that was the mean. It's not really clear exactly what, what that is. Um, but the important point here is what we really think is reasonable is the full range. It's not just the, the single curve that comes out of that. Um, and this is, why this is, um, what does this mean really? It's, it's that our best estimate of the future hazard is not a single number, but it's a range of numbers, um, and it, it will become. An example is from California, um, some real-world examples here, um, look that these look at only the uncertainty in the ground motion model. Um, and these are from relatively low seismicity areas. Um, and you can see there's um, a number of curves that represent different branches, essentially, in, in the logic tree, um, each one showing a different realization of what the, the hazard might be. And I, I didn't show it on the last slide, but the way you can use this, if you look at any particular on the, you go to the y-axis and you take off some probability, so maybe you take the 10% in 50 years or roughly the 500 year return period, and you look horizontally across that, that's giving you your range in the, the estimated hazard for the particular region. And as I mentioned, this is really only looking at the uncertainty in the, the ground motion models. This will, will almost always increase once you, this, this, this large spread will also increase once you in, in include uncertainty in the sources. And that hasn't been done a lot in the past, but that's really where a lot of the focus is happening around the world. And we could, we could spend a day talking about why that is. Um, so now moving on to a bit more of the, the physical science side. Um, on the, the seismicity rate modeling side, we've really increased our ability to model complex ruptures. We've known that for that we needed to do that for a long time. We've been doing that in past models, but KaiCor has really driven that home to a lot of people how, how much that, that matters. Um, we've improved our understanding of the data that we use. A lot of the data that we have is not actually data, um, but it's a model, and so we, we know better the quality, the completeness, the, the, the limitations of that, and so on. Um, in the last 20 years, um, the GPS networks have gone up. We get, we've, we get data from that now, so we can calculate the GPS strain rate, and that's actually had a big impact on what we, what we know. Um, and we've also learned a lot about subduction zones and, and how to, what they're capable of. Then on the ground motion side, it's, it's really become international standard practice now to use multiple ground motion models to represent the shaking. And there's a lot of different work on how you can um, improve on just grabbing a bunch of ground models and models and applying them. 
um, a lot of work on this. Most of these models that we can use are globally developed using global data sets. Um, and there's um, work that's gone on. How do you, such as what Brendan's done in the past, at, um, how you can regionalize those, make those models a bit more specific to New Zealand data. And there's a number of ways that can happen. Subduction zone ground motion modeling is important, advances there, and uh, ground motion simulations, I think everybody's aware of, are, are where everything is headed. Um, when one of the things we've, been, we, we've already been working on in terms of um, fault sources is this is what we're calling the New Zealand Community Fault Model. This is something that's really open to the entire scientific community in New Zealand, and we're getting contributions from, from earthquake geologists, seismologists, and so on. And the goal here is that we have a, the best 3D representation of, of the faults in, in New Zealand. Um, and this is something available to anyone working, working with fault data. So it's not something specific to seismic hazard modeling, um, but it's something seismic hazard modeling will use. And we have a beta version now um, that's got more than 600 faults in it. And we're hoping to have a one ready for release um, sometime within the next year or so. Um, that will have a big impact on how we can do things. Um, uh, sticking with faults for a little bit here, um, maybe this one's a bit philosophical again, um, but in, in, the, in the past, hazard estimates were traditionally done for long-term average earthquake behavior. So we say, what's the, what, what do we expect every 10,000 years or so, or 1,000 years, something like that? Um, Long-term averages ignore significant variations in earthquake behavior that we, that we see, that we know is in the data. And in the last 20 years, hazard estimates have, have really moved towards a bit of a mix of the next 50 years with long-term estimates, um, but really still focused generally on the long-term. Um, but the, the more we can move towards the next 50 years, and with, with some caveats, um, the more we can start to reduce the uncertainty and better target the means and the hazard that we're aiming for. And just to show a, a, a very nice example of that, this is a, a nice slide put together by Russ Van Dissen. On the right-hand side, this is Wellington fault data, and you can see there's some pretty distinct regime changes in that. And what I mean, if on the x-axis you have the the age in the, the time in the past in thousands of years, on the y-axis you have displacement um, along the fault. And you can see between roughly 3,000, 8,000 years ago, um, you have a, a relatively low displacement rate occurring. And then when you get to eight or 9,000 years ago, then it, um, it, it jumps up significantly to a much higher displacement rate. And if you, the, you can see on the diagonal there, that's the long-term average, which does not do a good job at all at representing the, the distribution that you see in, in the displacements rate. So there's a lot of work happening. Um, to how we can better model this this type of work. And we've got a lot more data that's been collected around the Wellington region. Um, this is for the Wellington fault and, and for other faults so we can we can improve how we do all of this. Uh, I've mentioned the GPS strain rate estimates. Um, so this is something that's come online in the last 20 years. And the, the, the most basic information that we get is shown on the left panel, and that's the velocity field. So this is showing slides put together from Haynes and Wallace, 2019, John Haynes and Laura Wallace. Um, and the, the vectors in this figure are showing the velocities that come from the GPS network. Um, I've lost my slides again. I don't know if everybody else can see it. On the right-hand side, you can, from those GPS velocities, you can see the, you can estimate the, the strain rate that's occurring at, at different depths in the crust. This is showing, I believe, the, the strain rate that's showing essentially in the, in the near surface of the crust. And you can see that's very heterogeneous throughout the North Island with kind of high concentrations of strain um, shown at the lower end of the North Island. And this is information that you wouldn't necessarily see in the other types of data sets that we have. And you can use this information to be converted into earthquake rates in different methods. Um, you can, we have roughly 600 faults in the, the community fault model, for example. For a lot of those, we don't have any slip rate information. We don't know how fast they're moving. You can use the strain rate um, estimates to, to help with that. Um, you can combine this with earthquake rates. So using the, the GNET earthquake catalog and smooth seismicity models, for example, you can, you can get um, quite significantly improved forecasts by combining those two, those two bits of information together. There's been a lot of work done on that. And finally, you can convert that into earthquake moment rate and then go into earthquake rates from that. Um, 
You may be familiar from the last decade with work that we've done on more clustering-based uh, models, and in the, in the last decade has really been more focused on aftershocks, but there's um, more relevant to the long-term hazard are the other types of long-term clustering models that aren't really looking at aftershocks, but they're looking at other long-term and long-range interactions. Um, and these these models have been have been shown to have pretty solid forecasting information in them. And in a lot of ways, they've been better than traditional um, hazard modeling methods. Um, this figure on the right, this is like this isn't hazard. This shows earthquake rates, so it's nothing about about ground shaking, but it shows different forecasts um, out to 2030. So they're they're limited to shorter time frames still. Their best information is really in the 10 to 20 year range, but it's relevant for the time periods that we're looking at. And this this particular model is is um, one based on empirical scaling laws that have been de developed globally and, and and also adapted to New Zealand. Um, and they, they really, every earthquake that occurs has some influence on the probability of future earthquakes in the, in the local region and how that scales as magnitude dependent and region dependent. And these have been very heavily tested, so we know more about these kinds of models than we do lots of other ones. This is a um, figure from David Rhodes and Anna Marie Christofferson. Uh, Hickering subduction interface. Um, again, a slide that Laura Wallace has put together for me here. We've 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 learned a lot in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, and what what's shown on this figure is um, and on the contours. That's a model of the interface. So between the Pacific Plate and the Australasian Plate, that's the the depths as the interface goes down. And you can see in the Wellington region, it's at about roughly 25 kilometers below the city of Wellington. So that's very close internationally. That's not that's not a common situation to be in where you have the interface so close to to the land and to population. Um, shown in the colors is the the coupling between the two plates. So what that means is the blue means it's relatively low coupling. So we have the plates sliding past each other, not necessarily creating large damaging earthquakes. And that you can, if you recall, we have multiple slow slip earthquakes every year. And they, these are these SSC are earthquakes that take a week to months to occur. And we don't we don't feel them on the surface of the earth. They're really occurring in the blue areas. Um, the red area is where the plates are locked together. So in the time that we've had um, DPS data in that red region and the lower North Island, we have no evidence that the plates have actually moved. So it's essentially getting loaded up as the rest of the plate is, is sliding. Um, this is important because there, there's certainly the, the potential or the likely that this, this will be released in, in an earthquake. It could potentially be based on the, the size of that, that patch. It could be a magnitude eight or greater. Um, and we, we also believe it could potentially rupture into the blue zones as well. We there's been a lot of effort in trying to understand what's happened in the past on on the Hikarangi, um, and so including some work by Kate Clark um, where she's looking at paleo tsunami evidence. So she's been going around different parts of the country and seeing what evidence has happened of has have tsunamis left in the past, and in that she's got roughly 10 past events, um, and that includes whole margin ruptures, meaning that the Hikarangi ruptured along the length of the of the North Island. Um, I won't say too much about this one, but complex multi-fault ruptures like we saw in Kaikoura, those don't seem to be all that uncommon in New Zealand. And this is an example on the y rapa fault that in um, just south of Featherston. This uh, was a, bit, a magnitude 8.1 that occurred in 1855. And I, I think the mo more or less the consensus is that when this, this large earthquake occurred, it also ruptured part of the subduction zone that was down dip from where the water rapid fault is. So essentially underneath Wellington um, has very large offsets, 18 meters laterally maximum. And this is a site pigeon bush where 18 meters occurred um, and seven meters meters vertically. And we, the, because the, the interface is, is so relatively shallow, these big, these large crustal faults like the Wellington fault, the Y rapid fault and other faults scattered up and down the North Island, it's likely that they intersect with the, the subduction zone at depth. So it is common, it may be common, or it's certainly possible that these are rupturing together. So we, we have now ways that we can include that in, into modeling and that impacts how we estimate the hazard for different regions. Um, I won't say too much about um, ground motion models. Um, I think Anna and Brendan are going to cover this a lot later. Um, but just quickly, this is some work done by, by Chris um, that he, he finished earlier this year. And this is really looking at better ways you can take 
the range of ground motion models. So we have internationally developed models. There could be a suite of multiple models. And then really looking at the uncertainty range that spans those models and look, trying to come up with the way you can represent those models in an unbiased way. Because those models aren't all independent of each other in the functional forms and the data that they used and so on. So this is a much improved way of how you can represent the ground motion shaking by capturing the uncertainty, but doing that in an unbiased way so you make sure you're not targeting the wrong, the wrong ground motion. Um, then you bring those, the, the, um, the sources and the ground motion together, and then we look at particular um, what's causing the hazard. And you can see something like these disaggregations which are um, from work that Brendan's done, but he's supplied these figures to me, and I think he might talk about these later. Um, but what these figures show are for a particular probability level of a particular return period, the, the sources, the magnitudes, and where they're, located, where they're located that are contributing the most to the hazard. So they, the, the height of the bar is how much they're contributing to the hazard. So the higher they are, the, the more important they are for the hazard in the region. And what you see is that either within a particular return period and, and definitely across return periods, you see a large variation in the sources that are contributing to the hazard, there's multiple sources at each return period. And each one of these sources can have very different ground motion characteristics. So it makes it, it, makes it quite challenging um, to start picking out sources that you might use to think about for what might occur in the region. Um, and I think I'm running out of time here, so I'll just quickly go through this one. Um, I think we, there's been discussion about the hazard increasing in the Wellington region, and I think an important point there is that that's come from the use of modern ground motion models that have used more data, um, do functional forms, and also because they use a suite of, of ground motion models. So they're not using just a single ground motion model, they're using a range of these just really to get a better handle on that uncertainty. And basin effects have not included been included in those, those discussions. And I'll, I'll just mention um, the same issues around the ground motion modeling for the Hickory Agnew subduction zone. Internationally, there's been a lot of work done. It's because of there's a there's not good data for there's almost no data for sites so close to the the, the interface such as we have in Wellington um, that simulations and simulators have necessarily become important in these calculations. And that's that's a question going forward is. Um, when are we justified to start using the simulation? So when do we know that the uncertainty that they're reducing is going down the right rabbit hole of, of where we want to go? Um, I think I'll just skip a couple of my summary slides here and just go to my last one. Um, Right over it. Um, just beyond scientific considerations, I think it's we, we need to be doing a bit more and thinking about how we, we do these this hazard modeling and really making sure that, that we're meeting the needs of the engineering community and the end user community in general. Um, and are they able to use what we, we put out? Is it too complex or so on? Um, and we also slightly different angle. We need to make sure that the treatment of uncertainty and conservativeness in the model is consistent with the expectation of the users because there's a infinite number of decisions that go into these models and kind of Similar to that, but this one really works both ways, um, is the treatment and understanding of uncertainty consistent across the hazard and the models that are then built on top of the hazard. And I think we have a lot of work to do in that space. And that was it. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, I'm just going to change tech a little bit now and talk about um, the Wellington Basin and its influence on um, ground motions. Um, so this is really just looking a little, in a little bit more detail at a specific um, aspect of the seismic hazard um, that is the site basin effects. Obviously, there are a lot of different things that contribute to the overall seismic hazard in, um, in any given place, but we'll just delve into um, the basin angle. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge um, my co-authors and, and, and collaborators, um, particularly Matt Hill, who has been um, a star in doing um, 3D ge geological modelling in, in Wellington, and also Liam Witherspoon at the University of Auckland, um, who's been part of this collaboration um, to map and model and understand the Wellington Basin. Um, so just starting very simply to begin with, um, site and basin effects. Um, uh, due to soil conditions and 3D basin structure, and they amplify earthquake ground shaking um, in any sedimentary basin. Um, so basically, the amplification depends on three 
um, key things. Primarily, um, the soil shear wave velocity and impedance contrast. So particularly when waves um, go from a sort of a harder, stiffer material into a very softer, um, looser material, um, they increase in amplitude um, and also can become trapped within that material. Um, so this um, impedance contrast is particularly strong between the rock um, and the sediments, but you can also get impedance contrasts at shallower um, levels within the sediments themselves, so from stiffer sediments through to looser sediments. Um, so a second factor that contributes is the shape um, of these 3D subsurface um, basins and the shape also of these soil structures within the basin. Um, so that's also a significant um, factor. And the last one is perhaps less significant than the other two, but it's still something worth considering, and that's the particular earthquake motion. Um, so different earthquake sources, so large, magnitude, small, different distances from a, a particular location, different um, as source site azimuths from the basin, um, may produce a slightly different or somewhat different um, amplification effect. Um, so what does this mean for Wellington? Well, we saw in the Kaikoura earthquake, um, these are some of the observed ground motions plotted as a percentage of the 1 in 500 year ULS spectra for Wellington. And um, so basically once you get into the sort of red colours, you're getting close to the... Um, 100% of that um, ULS um, spectra, um, and this is just this first plot I'm showing is just for 0.3 seconds, um, and you can see you know a variation of, of um, percentages around Wellington, but all well within or well well below that 100% um, threshold. So if you look at by contrast at the 1.5 second period range um, impacting sort of more mid-rise taller structures, um, you can see the percent of ULS is, is increased. Um, and in some places, reaches close to that 100%. Um, and all the variations you see in the ground motions here are due to basically site and basin effects, because we know the earthquake source is roughly the same distance from Wellington in all cases, and the path is relatively similar. So those differences in ground motion are, are due to essentially just site and basin effects. And of course, this is an example from one particular earthquake, the Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, and because of its distance from Wellington and the fact it was a very large event, um, we do see quite strong um, you know, ground motion at the one point for the sort of intermediate longer period range. Um, obviously, if we had a different kind of earthquake, even a, um, an earthquake closer to Wellington that was um, even smaller or mo moderate in size, you could get um, different things going on in, in higher ground motions in the shorter period range. And so for the Kaikoura earthquake, if we look at the um, spectral acceleration that was recorded at different places in central Wellington, so the CBD area, um, now these are all primarily um, site class D subsoil um, category. Um, and here in the, I'll just grab the pointer here, um, the black line um, here is the 1 in 500 year US design spectra. Let's move this around, sorry. <laughs> Getting used to this. Um, um, you can see all of the observed ground motions have a distinctive um, bump in the spectral acceleration between one and two seconds. And this is relatively consistently observed across that site class D and even into site class C um, areas of Wellington City. Um, the, the degree of amplification, however, does vary depending on where in the, um, in the basin you are. Um, so you can see some of these sites, say, they're, um, they're more in the waterfront or um, areas, which are also corresponding to to, to deeper soils as well as softer near surface soils um, show the highest amplification. Um, but the, the thick red line here is the average of all the other class D sites and you can see that it's quite prevalent across the, um, the whole set of stations. The um, pot site here on rock, the one at the bottom here, is, is, is quite a different spectral acceleration. So this is recorded at the edge of the basin um, on rock. Um, so how do we capture sort of these sorts of um, site basin effects in our ground motion models and, um, and design um, features? And so currently we assign um, subsoil class of A, hard rocks, to E, very soft soil. Um, and we have these discrete categories um, and using the ground motion model of McVeary 2006, or based on this, um, we've created different um, amplification factors um, applied to these different soil classes. Um, and so these factors are based on the 2002 National Seismic Hazard Model. Um, so modern seismic hazard models are moving beyond these discrete soil categories and use continuous geotechnical parameters 
I need to more specifically um, describe the site by providing a measure at a you know, particular location within the basin, um, whereas the discrete category, say class D, covers quite a broad range of different um, uh, site and soil conditions. And so some of these continuous, I'll talk on the next slide about some of these continuous parameters. And so we've recently done a, an effort modeling the Wellington Basin and up, um, updating our knowledge of the variation of these key parameters across the city. Um, so um, we've looked at these four um, parameters here. So Z1, which is the depth to one kilometer per second shear wave velocity. This is essentially the depth of the Great Rocky Basement in Wellington. Um, the site period, which is the fundamental period of soil amplification, you'll be familiar with in the site subsoil class, of course, um, and also VS30. Um, which is, um, this is work in progress for study. We've completed the, the other three um, mapping exercises. Um, so the three um, basin model projects that we've got in the Wellington region, I'll just go through these now. You can see here's a picture where you can clearly see the, uh, the Wellington Fault running along the western side of the harbour. Um, and so we've got basically models of the uh, upper hutch, a new model of the upper hutch, um, 3D area, the lower heart and harbour region, and what I'll concentrate on um, in the next slide is the Wellington CBD um, model. Um, so what we've done um, is, is update the original work of Simmons et al. in 2010, um, who did the first sort of 3D model and mapping efforts of, of oh, systematic mapping efforts of the Wellington um, CBD area. And so since that time, we've got a lot of extra data to, to draw on. So 1,200 um, plus boreholes and downhole in situ testing results. Um, so these have been collated by Matt Hill into a sort of into a GNS database as well. And of course, we're drawing very heavily on the New Zealand Geotechnical Database, as well as um, working with um, consultancies and, and, and the engineering sector to get um, the most up-to-date up information. Um, we've also drawn on new LIDAR data that helps us define the surface geological units in the city. Um, better than in, in the previous effort. Um, and then another effect, new feature of, um, of our model is the um, mapped onshore extension of the Aotea Fault. Now this was a new fault um, discovered in the, uh, in the Wellington Harbour by Niwa, so it's mapped or identified offshore um, due to offset sediments. Um, its location and its character onshore is, is quite uncertain, um, but we have in, in working on our model, we have basically found that the um, basin edge on that eastern side of Wellington is a little bit sharper and steeper um, than we previously thought, um, and so we have tentatively mapped um, the onshore extension of the Aotea Fault in, in that location. And so two key features or two important parts of the 3D model that we, um, that we focus on are the, basically the presence and thickness of soft soils in the near surface. So this is... Um, one of these elements is mapping the fill thickness um, through the uh, waterfront areas, and you can see this figure on the on the left hand side. And so the, the fill is sort of up to 20 meters um, deep in different places, um, and lies above a sort of a, a, a layer of, of soft or loose um, sediments. Um, and we've just this is an original effort um, that we've published in our report in 2019. Uh, since then, we've got additional um, information on the from the NZGD in the uh, Centreport area, which we're in the process of incorporating right now. Um, on the right-hand side here is the basement depth um, map, or Z, a, a proxy for Z1. Um, and you can see by the, the tiny black crosses, these are the locations of boreholes um, in the Wellington CBD area. You can see these are really concentrated in shallow parts of the basin. So uh, we don't have a lot of uh, boreholes, go, especially boreholes that go all the way down to basement, and that's what's shown here. Um, in, the, in the deeper parts of the basin. Um, so we need to draw on other, um, other data sets to be able to map those areas, including um, geophysical data sets, which I'll cover um, later on. Um, so this is just a run through of the, of the basin model. So this would be the Wellington Fault here on the uh, right hand side, um, with this is looking south. Um, on, the, on the left hand side is the mapped um, projected. Uh, extension of the Altia Fault. Um, so you've got the Greywicki basement surface there, um, and then above that you've got a layer of dense um, deposits. We've, we've separated these into lower and upper units, um, reflecting the difference in shear wave velocity of those um, units as they're um, very deeper or closer to the surface. 
Um, and above that, we've got a loose deposit. So there's quite a, a, a strong impedance contrast between those um, denser deposits and loose deposits, which can also lead to um, higher frequency amplification in parts of parts of Wellington City. Uh, above that, we've got swamp and marine deposits, um, sort of a, a thinner layer there, and, and then three generations of mapped fill. So, um, and these these um, units of fill tend to have different um, characteristics. You have engineered fill and hydraulic fill um, in different areas. So this is the, um, the three series of yeah, here we go three um, generations of fill there, um, and then the water on top. Um, and so this is both a geological model. Um, and a velocity model um, where we've assigned average velocity um, measures to each of these units based largely on the work of, of Simmons et al. Um, previously, um, but we're always looking to improve on, um, on that effort um, and, and develop the velocity model um, in the future. So to complement the, um, the borehole database um, that we have, We've also collected 400 plus new geophysical HPSR measurements. So this is um, an effort by the University of Auckland, led by Liam Wotherspoon, um, in collaboration with GNS Science. Um, so these really help to fill in the picture in the deeper parts of the basin where we have very little borehole constraints. And they also provide a block by block um, measurement um, from which to um, derive maps of site period, um, which I'll go into in a bit. So each of these measurements um, looks a bit like this. this is an HVSR curve where we see um, the frequency of amplification. In this case, it's a little bit complicated. We have these two peaks, one which we infer is due to the fundamental resonance of the, of the basin, um, and a higher frequency peak, which may be due to softer um, or shallower impedance contrasts in the, in the, within the sediment units. Um, so these have all been analyzed to come up with a new geophysical site period database. Um, and this is just a, a the, the whole data set here. So we've also assigned, um, looked at the quality of each of these measurements, and here we've, we've shown all the ones we think are satisfactory to excellent um, quality. Um, the map on the left shows you the, the site period value, and the map on the right um, shows you the amplitude of the um, HVSR measurement. Now, this is not the same thing as amplification of an um, earthquake motion, or expected amplification of earthquake motion, um, but it is related. So it does give you Although it doesn't provide an absolute value, it does give you a relative indication about where the um, amplification is highest. Um, and you can see that it is um, quite clearly highest in the center port or waterfront areas where you might have softer sediments near the surface, as well as really um, deep and thick layers of, of sediment. Um, and if you add into this geophysical site period um, database, all of the places where we have a borehole down to basement rock and from each of these locations, we can calculate the theoretical site period from our basin model um, and add these into the database as well as additional data points. Um, and so that's what you see here. Um, and so you can see these two, um, if I flick back between those two slides, so the plot on the left, these two data sets are quite complementary where the, the borehole is really providing those measurements in shallow parts of the basin and the geophysical um, database providing those measurements in the deeper parts of the basin. And, and combining these two together with a sort of a, a linear weighting scheme on both sides from the model and from the observations. Um, oh gosh, that looks strange. <laughs> um, we've uh, generated site period maps of the city. Uh, this is not quite what I, what I expected to show you. Um, this is our, our site period map, um, somewhat uh, squashed. Um, and each of these um, each of these measurements here is a, a measurement of site period from our database, and we've contoured this up. Um, you can see that the, obviously the longest site period measurements are here in the Centreport area um, over here, um, and as well as um, down here near the, the, the Tapapa location. And so basically two sub-basins in Wellington City. Um, the Thorndon Basin, we see quite complex variations in site period. Um, which we think are due to probably some near surface um, sediment channels, for instance, and complex variations there. Um, but we're also mindful of the fact that that location is very close to the Wellington Fault, which is bounding the basin on the western side. And there is a quite a strong possibility for basin edge um, effects there, not just at, um, at long periods, but also at, at higher uh, or at shorter periods. Um, that can also complicate the pattern of amplification that you see as you go out. Um, the Tiaro Basin, which is down here, um, is a somewhat um, simpler basin to map where we have um, boreholes and geophysical, um, or the 3D model and geophysical measurements having really quite good agreement um, on, on site period. 
um, I should have also had here that, um, that parts of the Thornham Basin may be deeper than we previously understood when we look at those site periods, we're getting slightly longer site periods consistently across that area um, than what was provided in, in Siemens et al. Um, so this is the this is the Tiara Basin. <laughs> I think I know what happened here. <laughs> um, this um, this is initially split up into two sub basins, but it's showing you both of them at the same time, squashing the figure, I believe. Um, so in the Tiara Basin, as I've already mentioned, there's a, a simpler period of amplification in that area. Um, one, I would say, I guess there are probably two general observations. Um, first of all, that those um, longer site periods really do occur in the um, centre port and Tepapa areas in both basins, um, where you've got deep, deep sediments and also um, soft sediments near the surface. So those two factors. Um, the second general observation we make is that at the steeply uh, dipping basin edges, and we think those basin edges are, are more steeply di uh, dipping than we had mapped in Simmons. Um, a 1D assumption does not necessarily capture the amplification effects from the 3D basin. So we tend to see site periods there that are longer than we would see if we um, just estimated them from a, a 1D profile, say taken from a 3D geological model. And um, so you have a slight mismatch as you get into those really steeply dipping areas. Um, and that's just something to be aware of if, um, you know, if, if you're using, just, if, you're, if you're basing um, uh, your assumptions on, on a 1D profile um, that the, in fact, the actual amplification may be, um, the period of amplification may actually be somewhat longer um, than that would assume. Um, so you, based on the site period map and the, the contour at 0.6 seconds, marking the boundary between class C and class D, um, as well as to, uh, looking at that um, BC boundary, which we have taken to be um, just three metres um, of soil overliving bedrock, and we've mapped the site classes um, and compared them here to the previous work of Simmons et al. Um, and fortunately, you can see, I mean, it's a good thing that they, they don't um, differ greatly, um, despite the variations in site period that we see um, when we look at a more detailed block by block scale. When you look back and just look at the um, 0.6 second contour and the, um, the map of Simmons, it does a pretty good job of capturing it. The biggest difference that we've mapped is here, up here in the um, Thorndon Basin area. Um, where we think that the site period is somewhat longer than was previously mapped and put some more constraint around that. And there's also minor variations in other, in other parts of the model. And so where do we go from here? So um, we've got, so basically the 2002-2010 the, the National Seismic Hazard Model used these discrete subsoil classes A to E, um, and that's based on the McVeary et al. ground motion model from 2006. Um, so the next generation or the next um, version of the National Seismic Hazard Model uh, will use modern ground motion um, prediction equations or modern GMMs. And these are largely based around Z1 and, and VS30. So we have new maps of Z1 and we're working on the map of VS30 currently. Um, and these continuous parameters really allow us to capture a little bit more site-specific uh, detail in our ground motion model. Um, however, they still don't take into account um, 3D basin effects or um, other um, potential specific amplification effects due to that um, particular basin. So in where we're going in future, with our future hazard models, is we're starting to think about how we could capture basin specific effects. And it's a very challenging problem and the international um, seismological community and engineering community, um, community have been working on it for, for a while. Um, there's lots of um, progress in that space and lots of outstanding questions as well. Um, so, what this might, um, what the sorts of things we might be considering in this space are looking at ground motion simulations, providing a different um, kind of ground motion model from which to um, um, to draw conclusions and make uh, and, and incorporate. Um, we're looking at non algoritmic approaches, so this would be where we use observational data from a particular location or region to really guide what the ground motion um, model could look like, um, and also reduce possibly or potentially reduce the uncertainty in some of these um, ground motion models that are based on very large um, empirical data sets. Um, and then there's a lot of thought that needs to go into how we combine these models, which features of the models do we rely on and which do we, um, do we downweight or, and how do we combine them in the, in the optimal way to get the best result. Um, so some of the big, um, the big questions we still have, for, for example, are how repeatable are these amplification effects? 
Um, and I know Brendan will be talking about that next, so I won't um, go into too much detail. Um, this is just a, a, a plot from one of his um, papers in BSSA. So the um, Cook Strait earthquake at the top, this is this yellow star here, um, the, ground, the Kaikoura earthquake at the bottom, these are um, spectral um, acceleration amplification curves. So with respect to the pot site, the rock um, pot site. Um, and you can see for each, and, and each line, obviously, is a different station in Wellington. Um, and you can see that these, um, the amplification features are very similar between these two earthquakes um, and, and are, in fact, similar for um, weak motion in general um, observed in the, in the Wellington region. Um, but we've got to remember as well, these two earthquakes occurred at roughly the same distance from Wellington and from the same source um, site, Azimus, so they have features in common as well. Uh, and also we've not seen strong shaking um, recorded in Wellington region, so the ground motions from the Cook Strait and Kaikoura sequence were still in the um, weak to moderate um, ground motion range, and um, which kind of brings me to the next, um, one of the next questions is um, what, sh what about other earthquake scenarios? Um, so you know, what about the, the sorts of events that dominate the hazard in Wellington, are the Wellington Fault event and the Hickorangi um, subduction event? Um, what might happen in those? Um, this plot here is just some modelling we did back, or modelling that John Zhao did um, back in 2010. Um, based on 1D soil profiles, it's quite um, approximate, quite rough, and it's using two different um, methods to estimate um, gra uh, ground motion amplification, taking into account um, soil nonlinearity at strong shaking. Um, so each of these um, curves is uh, a representative ground motion of a sort of say a 50 year occurrence um, type um, motion um, through to a thousand year. And then the, the lines in blue are um, two subduction earthquake um, simulations as input. So an 8.2 subduction earthquake and an 8.6 um, provided by Caroline Holden um, of GNS. And so, I mean, although there are lots of uncertainties that go into these two plots, um, you know, in, in, lots of, in, in both the modelling process and also the, um, the soil input parameters, um, what we do see is that um, the amplification, you know, it, it's quite plausible the amplification could be different at strong levels of shaking, um, or in, uh, say, in, particularly in a subduction zone earthquake, and that needs to be investigated further. Um, the amplification values we see from these models are a little bit, uh, quite a lot lower than the ob observed amplifications in Wellington during um, the Kaikoura earthquake and other weak shaking events. Um, so that's noted, and this may be due in part to the 3D basin effects that are not captured in this, in this type of modelling. Um, so that's something um, that needs further investigation. I think Brenda may also talk about that in the next um, segment. Um, so one of the ways we can look at <coughs> understanding this, th these sorts of phenomena a little bit better are earthquake simulations. Um, this was an early simulation done by um, Rafael Benitez of a Wellington um, fault earthquake. And here he took um, the land as 7.2 earthquake from California and transplanted it into the Wellington region and modeled two scenarios, the top one being a northeast to southwest rupture and the bottom one being southwest to northeast. And so this is Wellington City right in here, um, if you can see that. Um, and the maps are maps of peak ground velocity, so the maximum peak ground velocity. So it's not, it's not a map of amplification specifically, but it's a map of ground motion from these two different um, rupture scenarios. And what we, of course, see is that the ground motion pattern can be quite different depending on that earthquake source, even for an event of the same magnitude um, and the same location. Um, so it depends on other features like rupture directivity um, and also um, the details of the earthquake source itself, so where the slip is happening and the asperities um, on, that, on, on that fault plane, on that fault rupture. Um, so another question about what about different types of basins that we have. Um, so each basin obviously has its own specific amplification pattern. Uh, deeper, larger basins tend to produce fundamental period amplification at longer periods. Um, and from a modelling sense, this is more predictable or easier to model. Um, so you've, these types of amplifications are produced by really large scale um, structures in the subsurface. Um, and it's sort of, if you get a decent approximation of those structures, then you're able to model the ground motions um, through them. Also, this sort of long period motion is less affected by nonlinear effects from um, at, at really strong levels of shaking, making it um, well, easier to model. If you've got um, shallow complex basins, um, they produce amplification at shorter periods, and it can be quite variable from place to place within the basin. Um, and these really need fine-scale geological and velocity models to accurately model them. 
Um, and you also need to consider nonlinear soil effects. So amplification could be different for different earthquake scenarios. Um, and so ultimately that's, that poses quite a challenge to accurately and systematically um, capture basin effects. Um, so I'll just conclude, um, conclude now. Um, so we've got a 3D basin model, a new 3D basin model for Wellington um, and geotechnical maps. Um, so these have allowed us to better understand the 3D basin structure and how it influences ground shaking. So um, in particular, the maps, um, which are in a, a geoscience report um, published in 2019. And so we've got block by block mapping of site period. Um, and the, uh, it also shows the underpinning data so you can really look at the map and, and see what data is guiding um, is, is guiding that um, um, location if it's well constrained or not so well constrained if it's consistent or not consistent. Um, and we also have that database of um, geophysical and um, borehole site period estimates as well. Um, so we've got we've completed the Z1 depth abasement, the site period, and the subsoil class maps, um, and the VS30 map is still work in progress. Um, however, there's more work to do. So there's, um, and I think I'll hand over to Brendan now, who's going to talk a little bit more on the subject. Um, but we are doing research and planning research to better quantify basin-specific applications. So this is looking at things like 3D effects, um, nonlinear soil effects, um, the effects of the particular earthquake source and how consistent these are, and also considering different types of, of basins and approaches to use um, in different um, situations. Um, so I think, um, so this is a, a, a snapshot of the, the reports that we've issued, um, and I'll hand over to Brendan now to talk a little bit more on that last um, topic. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Anna. Uh, Chris, can you just confirm in the chat you can hear me okay? Just okay. Yep, perfect. Awesome. Okay, um, so uh, thanks everyone for the... Oh, before you start, Bring, I'll just remind everyone to uh, submit the questions to Pigeonhole. Uh, we've got a few good ones coming in, but don't forget to, to keep them submitting questions and upvoting them, the ones that you like. Cheers. Go ahead, Brendan. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so great to get a chance to talk to everyone uh, about this topic, and also uh, thanks to Matt and Anna for um, proceeding uh, with some content that I can leverage on, uh, which should save some of the slides that I want to talk about as well. Uh, so I'm going to follow on from some of those sentiments with a focus on uh, some further detail on the observed ground motion basin amplifications that we've seen in the Wellington region, uh, as well as what it implies for the modeling of future events. Uh, and I just note that uh, for those people uh, that want to follow along more closely, you can download a copy of these slides at that tiny URL link just there. Uh, and that'll be particularly useful because uh, the Adobe Connect platform doesn't allow video. Uh, and there's a couple of links that I'll refer to that you can watch in real time uh, if you choose to do so. Um, so there's really four main questions uh, that I want to talk about during this presentation. Uh, the first one is associated uh, with a more detailed understanding of what we observed uh, in Wellington from the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake as well as other moderate magnitude earthquakes. Uh, the second question is then to dive a little bit deeper into the underlying phenomena. Why did we observe uh, what we did? Uh, and then the third part of, as a follow on from that, is where have we seen this elsewhere, uh, both internationally as well as uh, analogues in New Zealand? And then finally, what can we do about it from a modeling perspective for future events using uh, three different possible uh, pathways? Uh, so again, a lot of this is going to leverage on some of the sentiments, uh, particularly that Anna mentioned, but also to some extent Matt. Uh, so just starting off with directly what we observed, we obviously have an image uh, shown here where we're looking at the Wellington City region, uh, and it's common, as Anna referred to, that because of the distance uh, from the Kaikoura event source, we can assume that the uh, ground motion intensity in the rock underneath all of these sites was relatively similar, uh, and therefore it's quite useful to take uh, a comparison between what we observed on outcropping rock sites, such as uh, the Wellington Potter or POTS site shown there on the right hand side in red uh, respect, with respect to the soil sites uh, that are annotated either in blue for the Thorndon Basin, which is uh, to the north, or for the Tiaro Basin annotated there in green. Uh, this is a particular example for the north-south component uh, of ground shaking, uh, but we can obviously produce uh, similar representations for the top two panels there, looking at north-south on the left and east-west on the right hand side, and then also for the vertical component shown uh, on the bottom. 
And there are some subtle differences uh, that can be quite important. I'll just mention a few of those in passing. Uh, first, you'll notice that at long vibration periods, uh, we actually have uh, directivity in the ground motions, even though we're 60 odd kilometers from uh, the Wellington region, we still have that strong northward propagation of the rupture that gives higher amplitudes in about the sort of five to seven, seven second period range. Uh, and we also see relatively similar levels of ground shaking uh, in the one to two pe second period range between Thorndon and the Tiaro sites. In contrast, for the north-south component, we see stronger shaking in the Thorndon area. Uh, one of the most notable parts is when we look at the vertical component of the ground motion, again, particularly in that one to two second period range, you'll notice that in Thorndon, the amplitudes in blue are quite a lot higher than the underlying rock records, whereas in Tiaro, the amplitudes are relatively similar. Uh, and because we know that uh, there's very little um, sort of one dimensional amplification of vertical ground motions from site response, and that the majority of it is happened by uh, converted body waves to surface waves, that what we're really seeing here in those blue uh, response spectra in the vertical component is converted Rayleigh waves from, uh, from the basin edge. So that uh, really helps again uh, for us to distinguish that not all basins are the same, and in this case uh, the basin edge phenomena, which I'll talk about subsequently, is much more pronounced in Thorndon uh, than it is what we, where we see it in Tiaro. Uh, obviously, one event uh, doesn't give us enough information to confirm whether things are repeatable or not, uh, so we can, of course, uh, look at multiple events. Uh, one of the logical extensions would be to look at the 6.6 uh, .6, uh, magnitude earthquakes in 2013, either the Cook Strait or Lake Grasmere events, which happened within about a month of each other. And so this figure shows uh, six different sites that uh, were a subset of six in the, the previous Wellington city uh, schematic that I showed before, and obviously we get different uh, ground motions in each of those six sites because of the fact that the earthquake source was different. Uh, however, coming back to that trend before, we can try and normalize a lot of uh, the so-called source and path effect uh, by dividing the recorded observations here by the underlying rock observations, uh, and if we do that, we come back to uh, these two figures, for example, uh, that Anna showed toward the end of her previous presentation, highlighting the fact that the spectral amplification or the soil response spectra divided by the rock response spectra uh, is showing relatively similar trends for these different events. Now, I use the word relatively similar definitely in an engineering context. Clearly, there is differences from event to event. There is some variability in that behavior, uh, but I think you'd agree with me that the trends are relatively similar. Uh, where we see, particularly with a focus on longer uh, periods, so uh, beyond about 0.3 seconds, we see this linearly uh, increasing level of amplification as the period increases. Uh, it reaches a maximum somewhere on the order of one to two seconds, where the amplitudes vary from anything from about three up to about seven or so. Uh, and then it starts to decline, uh, and from about five seconds and beyond, the level of amplification is actually relatively close to one. Uh, and so then in the dashed lines uh, underlying each of those colored lines for the different sites, you can see the corresponding site amplifications that are um, used in uh, NZS 1170 for three different site classes. Uh, and so what we see is that you know, clearly those are a gross simplification uh, of what we observe at these actual sites, both in terms of the level of amplification suggested, but also the fact that that uh, code-based amplification is suggested uh, constantly from a period of one second to 10 second, whereas we clearly see that for periods beyond about five seconds, we get quite a significant reduction. And so I really uh, think this is a useful uh, example to really draw our attention to the fact that ultimately when it comes to site response, what we care about is the level of amplification of the ground motion. We try and infer that by using site conditions and then correlating site conditions to site amplification. Uh, but this is a perfect illustration where a lot of heated debate over the past 10 years or so about where is the so-called CD boundary in Wellington, which is a geotechnical based definition. This is really detached from the reality in terms of what amplifications we're actually observing. Uh, if you keep in mind that those dashed lines between C and D imply amplifications from about 1.3 to 2, whereas in reality at periods of 1 to 2 seconds, we're seeing amplifications of 3 to 7. Okay, so now let's dive a little bit deeper into those uh, observations and try and understand first uh, why are we seeing them, where have we seen them uh, historically in the past, and then what we can do about them. Uh, 
Uh, so there's a couple of key phenomena that I want to talk about here, and the, the word basin effects, basin edge effects, uh, or similar levels of jargon are sort of thrown around a lot, and I think it's quite important uh, for us to have a, a more nuanced collective understanding of what those different terms mean, and why they're appropriate in some conditions and why they're not appropriate in other conditions. Um, so some kind of wave propagation basics here uh, in these next couple of slides. What we have on this figure in the left half of the slide is uh, an illustration of an incident wave uh, approaching a material interface from the left. Uh, and then as it hits the material interface, there's a transmitted wave and a reflected wave. And depending on the impedance of those two materials, uh, you'll get a refraction or a bending of that wave. In this particular case, it's shown for the usual scenario where as we approach the ground surface, the material gets softer and the wave gets bent toward the vertical component. Uh, we can extend that idea now in this right-hand image, which is the, the same concept, but now with multiple layers, uh, and also illustrating the fact that when we go through those layers, conservation of stress uh, implies that as we come to the surface with softer deposits, the amplitude of the ground motion increases as well. Uh, so what we have on the um, left hand, sorry, on the, the, the first uh, wave is an incident wave, which is refracted twice as it moves through materials two and materials three, and you can see the dark black color indicating high amplitude. Uh, but then at each of those different interfaces, we also get a reflected wave, uh, and I'll draw your attention to the first reflection between material two and three, which reflects downward back to material one, back upward to material two, and then back upward through material three. So that's, that's essentially the process we see of scattering. Uh, and so those waves arrive later uh, in time, and also because of the loss of energy associated with each of those different reflections and refractions, the size of that uh, amplitude also reduces. Uh, now, the next thing that happens associated with refraction is depending on uh, the, the difference in the velocities of those two different materials and depending on the angle at which uh, the ray hits the boundary of those two materials, we get a different level uh, of refraction. So these three images are showing uh, uh, angles of incidence that increase from moving from left to right relative to the so-called critical angle. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have subcritical incidence where you get a transmitted wave. Uh, in the middle panel, we have a critical angle where you have a transmitted wave, but it uh, propagates perpendicular, uh, sorry, parallel to the material boundary. And then on the right-hand figure is where the incident angle is even higher, uh, and you actually get no transmitted wave, and all of the energy uh, is reflected back within the material one medium. Now, the most common instance of this in practical problems is actually to sort of flip it upside down. Uh, where that material one is the basin sediments and then material two is the underlying rock and so we get that trapping uh, of energy. The other important thing to keep in mind is that critical angle which for these three figures uh, is a constant, it's about 30 degrees, uh, that angle is actually a function of the velocity ratio between the two materials. And so it's typical, approximately speaking, that for basins, the, the basin shear wave velocities are somewhere on the order of 20 to 50 percent of the the underlying rock values, and what that means is the critical angle will vary anywhere from 10 to approximately 30 degrees, meaning that if the incident angle is greater than that value, you get total internal reflection. And so hopefully you can see here that for typical basin conditions uh, that we have in New Zealand, it's actually quite easy uh, for this total internal reflection phenomenon to occur. Uh, so now a perfect illustration tying those uh, concepts that I've just mentioned in the previous two slides together uh, is if we look at this um, sort of simplified uh, ground motion simulation from a paper that uh, is published in 1993. And there's three different uh, sort of subplots that are shown here. On the top left hand side we have a typical rock site with uh, a wave front propagating up to the surface measured at the inverted triangle. And just above that you can see the signal that's recorded. Uh, below that is a soil site. Um, the properties of the soil site is that the soil thickness is constant. And so again, we see a record at that individual location. There's some reverberation because of the trapping of energy uh, within that soil site. And then on the right-hand side of the figure, we now have the basin pro profile, which is shown at the very bottom uh, right-hand side, where we actually have an inclination in the thickness of uh, that basin. So if we draw parallels between these three different cases, uh, when we make the, the top recording in the basin profile, which is for the leftmost of the five different inverted triangles, that's basically the same between the rock site and the basin. Uh, 
when we make the measurement uh, at that generic soil profile in B uh, versus the measurement at all of the sites in the basin, that initial wave arrival is the same as it would be for a sort of general 1D basin. But then we get this inclined late arrival where the, the time delay associated with arrival increases as we move from left to right across the basin. And that's essentially this basin uh, generated surface wave that's getting trapped in the basin and then uh, essentially propagating laterally across the basin. And therefore, the further you go to the right, the longer it takes for that wave to arrive. Okay, so these phenomena um, are what we uh, are seeing in uh, Wellington. They've also been seen uh, significantly in the past. Uh, um, and so just to draw your attention to a couple of examples from historical earthquakes that many of you will uh, recognize well, although maybe uh, haven't always tuned specifically to the, this phenomena of basin and basin edge effects. Uh, so the first is from the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, looking at four different stations uh, in the Marina district of San Francisco. Again, this is a case where the event itself was probably on the order of 60 or 70 kilometers. Uh, from the San Francisco waterfront. Uh, I'm overlaying here depths of uh, depth to rock, to the uh, Franciscan rock, uh, shown by contours. And then this particular study showed how with simulated ground motions matching them to observations, we see uh, this basin edge phenomena around the edges and also a consequent increase in the duration of ground motion uh, in the bottom. Uh, the next uh, probably most notable example is in Kobe during the 1995 uh, earthquake there. Uh, where we had this really strong phenomena of the so-called damage belt located just uh, to the southeast of the fault trace. Uh, in this paper by Kawase, they uh, developed a numerical model to simplify that basin edge boundary uh, and then performed these calculations and generated these results that I'm showing on the right hand side here, which uh, plot on the vertical axis the intensity of ground shaking. Uh, for the top figure, that's in terms of acceleration. For the bottom figure, in terms of velocity. And on the uh, x-axis, in terms of the distance from the basin edge. Uh, and what you see when you look at the solid lines, which is the horizontal component of the ground motion, is that we see approximately a sort of linear increase uh, in the amplitude, both for acceleration and for velocity, out to a distance of about 1,000 meters, then a gradual reduction to a distance of about 1,600 or 1,800 meters, and then a relatively constant value. And so what we're seeing over that sort of first 1,600 to 1,800 meters is really the basin edge phenomena. And then as we get further beyond 2,000 meters, we're really seeing there just the general impedance as the wave propagates from the rock up through the basin directly rather than that uh, constructive interference of the edge generated wave at the edge. Uh, another example in the Northridge earthquake in Santa Monica. So those familiar with this area will know the Northridge earthquake was uh, further north from this figure. Uh, and so again, the, the source is relatively distant with respect to the location that we're looking at here in Santa Monica. Uh, and what we're looking at in this particular figure, the black um, sort of jaggedy lines are outcrop scarps of the Santa Monica fault. The red dots are red tagged buildings, indicating obviously high levels of damage. And the blue circles are indicating the strength of ground shaking uh, in terms of amplifications from seismic measurements. Uh, and so similar um, conclusions here through numerical analyses, identifying the basin edge effect and showing uh, both the strength of the amplification near the edge and also the, as you move further away, the reduction. Uh, and then finally, just to to highlight the fact that it's not only international, that we did see uh, similar phenomena, for example, in some of the Canterbury earthquakes, the most pronounced example in the Heathcote Valley. Uh, many of you would be familiar with that uh, instrument for recording the largest accelerations consistently through many of the Canterbury earthquake events. Uh, and through numerical analyses, again here, uh, the top figure showing a schematic of that analysis model, the middle one showing a particular snapshot in time where the vectors are indicating the particle movements and you can even see the, the sort of Rayleigh wave components uh, there. And then illustrating that using these 2D or 3D models has given us a better prediction of observations than what we get with just based on a one dimensional model. So really now that, that moves on to the, the fourth component, which is given those observations, given our understanding of the basic phenomena and the fact that we've seen these effects repeatedly internationally as well as in New Zealand, how do we actually try and quantify these? Uh, and so really there's sort of three ways that we can do it. Two of them are empirical, uh, based on either sort of direct modifications to uh, design spectra, uniform hazard spectra, 
either modification of empirical ground motion models that underpin uh, code spectra and then redoing seismic hazard calculations to drive uh, updated versions of such spectra or using more fundamental approaches uh, from a physics based simulation perspective. Now there's the usual uh, pros and cons that you might expect when comparing these two general different approaches. The empirical approaches are based on data therefore they're much easier to develop. Uh, they do have extrapolation problems mainly associated with how you go beyond the data in terms of uh, different geographic locations within a region. So for example in Wellington how do you extrapolate beyond the effects that we see at the eight or so seismic instruments to the general uh, Wellington region interpolating between those two sites for example. How do you take lessons from one region to another region? How do you understand phenomena such as where the relative location of the source with respect to the basin is and how are the effects of ground motion amplitude accounted for? Uh, from a simulation, physics-based simulation perspective, they are harder to develop, but they're more generalizable in the sense that the physics really provides the framework for that extrapolation. Uh, and so rather than extrapolating directly a complex phenomena, we really uh, use our underpinning understanding to let the simulations that try and address the physics more comprehensively tell us what the outcome should be. Uh, so going through each of these relatively briefly in turn, uh, if we start with a, a focus purely on how do we use observations to directly make adjustments to uh, code-based uniform hazard spectra or design spectra, uh, an important thing to understand is how we make use of those observations differently. So we have the underpinning hazard which is derived as Matt described from seismic source models and ground motion models. We then have a codification of that hazard and then of course we have observations. So because the seismic hazard is a probabilistic quantity, we have different hazards for example for different exceedance probabilities or return periods, then we can't directly compare observations with hazard in a meaningful way uh, to understand bias and models. What we actually have to do is make some normalization and the most appropriate way to do that is based on site amplification ratios. Uh, alternatively if we compare directly with the underpinning ground motion models we can actually do a direct comparison between prediction and observation. Okay, so uh, some examples of uh, how we could make some of those adjustments. Uh, following on the sentiments that I echoed earlier where we can look beyond just the Kaikoura event to other large events and I showed two other events greater than six. Uh, uh, we've actually done some analysis uh, of approximately 20 events uh, that are magnitude five or greater. Uh, and so this is the same type of plots before where on the y-axis we're looking at the amplification between the soil site and the underlying rock site and on the x-axis we're looking at vibration period. Each of the different gray lines indicates that level of site amplification for one of the 19 different events. So there's 19 different gray lines. The black line is then the mean of those 19 different gray lines and then the red line in particular is highlighting the amplification specifically for the 2016 Kaikoura event. And finally the blue line is indicating the site class D amplification uh, indicated by NZS 1170. Uh, so again this is seismic problems that are complicated uh, and are alluded to some of the important subtle effects uh, that clearly have a factor and we do see that variability in these 19 different observations. But also there are some quite clear systematic trends that we can use uh, to try and at least make our predictions mean centered so we don't have a, a clear bias as indicated here between the difference of the blue line and the solid black line. Uh, if we then take the solid black lines for each of the individual stations, uh, this figure is showing the mean site amplification for uh, how many, we've got five different stations shown there relative to the site class D spectrum. Uh, and then what we're also, uh, what I'm also showing is some simplified adjustments uh, for each site based on a generic uh, sort of log, uh, sorry, generic uh, bell curve shape that can be added to the site class D spectrum. Uh, and really there's two main factors associated with that bell curve shape. One is what period is it centered around and one is what sort of amplitude uh, do we have. And so we can come back to those lessons of the underlying phenomena and what, they, what we've seen in previous events such as the Kobe earthquake uh, to understand how does that amplification parameter, the height of the bell curve, uh, vary as a function of distance to the basin edge. So uh, fitting one of those bell curves to each one of the different sites gives a value uh, shown in blue. Uh, and then of course we can come up with different representations for how to try and parametrically describe those blue points either by having 
uh, initially no amplification and then once we get uh, to a certain distance, say 200 metres or 0.2 kilometres, we start to have some amplification or we can have a, a dash line that goes um, immediately from a value of zero. So there's, there's obviously multiple ways that we can try and represent that. Uh, and then that allows us to develop figures uh, such as what's shown on the right hand side there, which is that level of base and amplification uh, as we have different values of distance from the base and edge x and, and also how that value varies as a function of period. Okay, so now uh, Matt made the uh, important comment that empirical ground motion models have advanced a lot since uh, those models that were used in the uh, 2004 uh, uh, design code. Uh, and so what do they tell us? So um, as sort of a two-figure uh, summary of some of the key sentiments, uh, this figure is showing three of the stations uh, in the Thorndon Basin, the level of site amplifications we see, uh, and then in the black line is showing the level of site amplification predicted from uh, one of these empirical ground motion models when we take the ratio between what we would predict on rock with what we would predict on a general soil site uh, representative of these three different specific sites. Uh, and one of the most important things to note here is the level of amplification at long periods is about three to three and a half for a, for a vibration period of between say one and five seconds. Uh, and for example, that's quite a lot higher than the value in the design code of, of a value of two for site class D soils. And you'll also notice that we do see that reduction in the black line of the amplification as the vibration period increases. Uh, so the main message I want to convey with this slide is that uh, these empirical models that are the basis of, for example, site-specific hazard studies and uh, any subsequent updates to the National Seismic Hazard Model do account at least to some extent for these phenomena, but they don't account for it entirely and we do obviously still see some deviation uh, between the empirical model and the observations. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, the level of um, nonlinear effects that are present in the prediction of these observations using empirical models. Uh, and this is a little bit of a, a complicated figure, but I'll, if I just explain uh, what we're seeing starting on the top uh, left hand image, on the y axis we have the level of site amplification, so again soil site divided by rock site. On the x axis we have a VS30, which is essentially an indicator of soil stiffness. So VS30 values on the left hand side, 100 are very soft soils, all the way through to 1000 meters per second is essentially rock. Uh, and then the multiple lines on each one of the figures is indicating how the predicted site amplification changes as the level of rock ground motion changes. So the solid black line is for essentially small levels of ground motion where you have linear site behavior. And then as you move through the dash lines, the level of ground shaking increases and you get a reduction uh, in the amplification, particularly as you move to the left for soft soils. Uh, but now the four different panels are for different vibration periods. So the top left is for 0.01 seconds or essentially PGA. The top right is for 0.1 seconds. The bottom right, the bottom left is for 0.3 seconds and the bottom right in particular is for one second. Uh, and then finally the blue dots in each of those figures represent approximately the level uh, of ground motion that existed in the Kaikoura event and therefore my indication of the level of nonlinearity effects. And so what we see looking at the bottom right hand figure in particular uh, is that we both have less effect of nonlinear behavior for longer period measures. So at one second, those multiple dash lines are actually a lot closer together than they are at other vibration periods, for example, 0.3 seconds. Uh, and then the second thing is that we want to keep in mind the Kaikoura event wasn't as big as uh, other events that we may think of when we think of the Wellington seismic hazard, but actually it was large enough to induce some level of nonlinear behavior, at least as predicted from these empirical models. Okay, finally, um, from the perspective of using physics-based simulations, so uh, some of the sentiments that I've echoed already, as well as those that Anna mentioned in the previous presentation, point to the uh, somewhat obvious limitations with these empirical approaches. Uh, how do we make use of lessons from one region to other regions of New Zealand? The fact that these are 3D uh, geometries of the basin and therefore some of the specifics of how the source uh, is located with respect to the basin are also explaining some of that variability we see. Uh, and then also there's other things not seen in the observational data uh, that we may want to try and explore. Uh, and so we need models for these sedimentary basins and are focused uh, on the excellent work that's been done in the Wellington region. And then of course there's other uh, 
uh, basin models, similar levels of detail in the Canterbury region, and then more simplistic models, uh, but models nonetheless for other basins in New Zealand. Uh, and so then we can start to use these models to understand uh, what, uh, what simulations would tell us from a physics standpoint uh, for the levels of amplification. Uh, here's where um, I refer you to the videos at the links below. Uh, and just to kind of show you a couple of screenshots of, of what they suggest, uh, that as that wave propagates uh, from a past earthquake in 2013, we get this amplification in the Wellington Basin region, particularly along that boundary with the, the basin edge of Wellington. Uh, and then, of course, we can start to look at uh, events in the future, such as this one shown here, for a potential magnitude 8.6 earthquake on the Hikurangi uh, subduction zone. And we can model uh, all of the phenomena important, including uh, basin edge effects, um, as the way uh, as the rupture propagates from the south uh, through to the north as well. And so, this events like this are useful both for us to understand uh, shaking in Wellington, but also, for example, in this case, you'll notice that. Uh, large magnitude events on the subduction zone are likely to produce um, non-negligible shaking in regions such as Auckland and Northland as well. Uh, finally, we can obviously make use of simulations directly, but also we can make use of simulations to inform our understanding of empirical models. Uh, so Matt made uh, several good comments on the variability that we see using alternative empirical models. And these two uh, figures on this slide just highlight several different models for predicting ground motions uh, in terms of peak ground acceleration on the left, or three second response spectral period on the right, uh, for magnitude nine earthquakes um, as a function of, of these different models. So clearly we can start to use these simulations to understand which of these models are plausible uh, and which ones are less plausible and therefore would be downweighted in the empirical analysis. Uh, so uh, I'll skip through the conclusions. Um, again, uh, these slides are available online um, and so Happy to take uh, questions along with uh, the presentations from Matt and Annie as well. Thank you. Well, thanks to all the speakers. Um, so three very good, very interesting presentations. Um, uh, Chris and I will just go through the, um, the pigeonhole questions, and then we'll bring those up on screen. Um, so. I guess there is one that's uh, kind of clearly leading the, the boats at the moment. Um, uh, probably a difficult one for, for Matt to answer, perhaps. But um, for Matt, regarding the cluster-based model, do we need to update our hazard model every time there is a significant earthquake? Uh, is the future an electronic hazard map that is always updating? And there is also a couple of um, sub-questions that have been posed with this. Um, that uh, saying basically, does that make engineering sense for designers uh, or building owners uh, as the building ratings change as a result? So, uh, pretty, pretty a bit of a curly one there for you to start that. Oh, no, it's not too bad. Um, the, the short answer is that, sorry if I, I implied that I think that's the right way to go. Um, that's not really my call to make, and that's not, not what I was intending to suggest. Um, I guess most relevant is not really our our role as scientists to suggest what is needed to make decisions. We could just provide the different information that we can do, and it's and it's really the role of the engineering community and the insurance community and so on to say what what they need. Um, I guess related is the clustering I was discussing in this in my presentation wasn't something that really changes so much on the yearly level. It's more long-term clustering that I was looking at. I mean, there can be changes after a big event, as the question says. Um, but generally, the, the changes are, are, are years to decades in where, where they're coming in. So it's not the same kind of clustering that we might do in terms of an aftershock. Um, it, does, it, does, I mean, it does bring up the question that once an, a large event has occurred, we suddenly know a lot more, and we can reduce the uncertainties. Um, so it really comes down to um, people that are using the models to know if that's useful information for them to have. Um, and I think that's discussions that we can have going forward. All right, thanks, Matt. We've got um, a few other questions there. One for oh, asking me how well you answered it, Matt. I can't read the other questions. Sorry, Jeff, can you jump in and take the next question? Um, so, Brendan. How do you think the subsoil class system needs to be adapted to take into account your findings that CD does not capture the reality of the site behaviour? And there is also a sub-question to that, um, yeah. which was, um, I think that 
Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> I think it's being answered now and is code oriented and peripheral adjustments. you have anything further to say on that, Brenda? Oh, um, let me go with the first one that I can see on the screen, Jeff. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the important thing for, as a general principle is where we don't have knowledge, uh, then it makes sense to use generic amplifications um, that are based on globally available data or New Zealand specific data if, if New Zealand specific data is sufficient. Uh, however, once we start to get sort of location or region specific data that points to the limitations of that more generic levels of amplification, then clearly we should start to uh, make use of that. So um, this is always going to be a situation where to some extent uh, codes and guidelines are going to lag behind uh, sort of conventional understanding. Uh, and so we're now getting uh, three and a half years past the event. These, un these things are quite well understood. Uh, so obviously some people will wait for that to be formally included in uh, standards and guidelines, but um, obviously it's important upon us as an industry to try and make use of what is well understood knowledge before that point. Great, thanks Brendan. A uh, question for Anna here. Do you think that the HVSR measurements provide an accurate picture of the site period for the Thornton Basin for engineering purposes? Right. Um, well, that's a good question. Um, so, overall, generally speaking, yes, I think. And we, we, as I mentioned previously, we don't have a lot of deep borehole constraints um, in the Wellington Basin, so so that we can validate all of those HBSR measurements across. And that would be ideal to have. Um, where we do have those constraints, we've got one, for example, deep borehole down to 110 odd metres um, down to bedrock. Um, the site period calculated from our model matches the observed HVSR site period really quite well. Um, so in the limited places where we have constraints, it does um, it does seem to do a relatively good job. Um, and in, in that area, we see a very strong HVSR peak, and we can follow that peak moving out from that borehole location um, across the basin. In parts of the basin, it gets a little bit more ambiguous. Um, but I think overall the HVS are, are probably giving us the best um, information we currently have on that. Um, there's one, um, I suppose, one um, caveat to that in the fact that what is rock is a question that comes up sometimes. What we're measuring with HVSR is really the fundamental um, period response all the way down to grey wacky basement. Um, so, um, you know, engineering bedrock, if you take that to be somewhat above in um, grey wacky basement, then you might, um, you might deduce a different um, site period measurement, but from a from a seismological perspective, it's the whole column that's resonating, and that's what we see in our HVSR data, is the whole um, depth all the way down to Grey Wacky. Okay, got one here for Brendan. Um, it looks like the site period in Tiaro is a an order of magnitude different in each direction. Would you consider, um, sorry, the question just moved on there. Basically, would you consider ever, ever classing the soil differently in two directions? I'm not quite sure I understand the nature of the question. Um, it's definitely different between the horizontal and vertical components. Uh, the the behavior in in the two different directions is not exactly the same, but it's somewhat similar. Um, I think, you know, in the same way it's currently common to consider, for example, near fault forward directivity uh, in design. Um, we know the orientation of a particular fault strike relative to the footprint of a building. Um, so in concept, there's no reason why, again, knowing the footprint of the building, we wouldn't consider the fact that the shaking can be stronger uh, in some regions than the other. Of course, it's important to keep in mind that um, directionality dependence because of side effects versus the similar dependence that can occur due to source effects. So uh, before we start jumping too far uh, down that line, we want to understand the source effect variability as well. I think that's what the question was asking. Another question from Matt here. Is the NZS 1170.5 2004 prepared 16 plus years ago general design response spectrum fit for purpose? It's missing the 2010 NSHM updates from Sterling et al. and more, let alone the knowledge presented here. Um, I think one thing that 
miss, gets missed sometimes in, in these discussions around this, this particular question, which is obviously a common one, is that the, the two things are trying to do fundamentally different things. So in, in the hazard model, we're producing, all we're doing is producing hazard, it's just the shaking. And where the, the decisions in 1170 and loadings requirements are really are taking into account risk. So there's there's a big layer between the two and that really needs to be considered and that completely that can completely change the picture. And it also, similar to the previous question, that that's where it takes it out of the realm of what we as scientists can can really provide. Um, but having having said that, I think it, it's clear that the hazard has has changed a lot, and the, the the existing and potentially revised hazards does does need to be considered. And I think there's 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 fairly good agreement on that. That's what what needs to be done. So a question here for Matt, uh, is the new information on New Zealand seismicity solely due to additional data from recent earthquakes? I think that improved understanding of the complex phenomena of earthquakes must also have been considered, must have also con have contributed. That's from Rajesh Jakal. Uh, good, good question, Rajesh. Yeah, you're, you're correct. Um, I think the, the bigger the, the, the bigger changes are, are coming from methodolo methodological changes, our understanding. So not just understanding of the complex phenomena, but how, how actually how we can model that within things like National Seismic Hazard Model. Um, data data improvements do matter. I mean, I think particularly on the ground motion modeling side, we've got a lot more data in the, the data regions that, that we need it. Um, but overall, the biggest improvements um, are, are coming on our scientific understanding and methodological changes. Question for Anna here, quite a nice one. How important is the geotechnical data yeah, the ends of geotechnical doing this work? Could these models have been created without the collaborative effort? Right. Um, it's, it's been hugely helpful. So um, the previous um, model of Siemens essentially um, was, was done prior to this um, effort. And so we, we used the, the, this database and this framework as a start. Um, the NGD has been an invaluable resource for really collecting um, information since then. It's not, I mean, not the only source, but it's definitely the dominant source of information um, and it's been hugely helpful. So um, what Matt Hill's done is collect um, sort of way through the information on there and sort of compile it. He sort of assessed the quality of some of that information and come up with a sort of ranking system for the for boreholes, for instance. Um, and then he's got, you know, there's access to different kinds, you know, we've got the CPT measurements, the SCPT measurements, um, borehole lithological logs and so on. Um, and so he's really relied heavily on, on the information available there and then created his sort of own in-house system um, to, to, to quantify it, um, assign quality and, and to work with those data. Another question here for Anna is from, from Peter Wood. Um, does the current usage of 2D soil site classes, uh, A to E, give such primitive results that the use of 2D soil classes should be discontinued? Uh, with obviously some sort of adjustment to the building standard. Right. Um, I mean, in terms of what should be done in the building standard, I can't, um, I can't really answer that question, but from a hazard perspective, um, I mean, as Brendan has alluded to in his, um, his talk, the, you know, the discrete soil categories have their limitations. So you have one soil category for most of the, the deeper soils in Wellington City and one, um, one model you know, for, for that soil. Um, obviously, when we move to continuous parameters, you're really, from a hazard perspective, better able to capture that true variation across the city. Um, so that's things like VSODZ1 or you know other other approaches in future. Um, and I would add that you know the VSODZ1 is used quite you know quite routinely in site-specific studies, for instance, um, to look at the hazard. Um, so um, you know it can capture better some of those those variations. You know what's done from a design perspective has to take into account multiple perspectives and in, in, in users um, as well as as what's going on with the seismic hazard. But that's um, something to consider. Question for Brendan here: Does eleven seventy point five? Sorry. Just there. Does 1170.5 effectively deal with pulse motions from near fault sources? How important are basin effects for Wellington relative to the near fault effects? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think the, there's two parts to it, obviously. I'll start with the second one. Um, the, the importance depends on 
on the specific structure and also the nature of the earthquake uh, necessarily manifest at the same vibration periods or uh, not always are both of them important. So in the case of Wellington, they can be both important if the earthquake is nearby and you're located in the basin. Uh, but for example, as I uh, drew attention to the uh, directivity effects in the Kaikoura earthquake, they were manifesting at about five to seconds, five to seven seconds vibration periods, whereas the basin effects were most pronounced on a sort of one to two second period range. Obviously, there's some overlap where in the sort of three to four seconds period range, there was a little bit of basin amplification, a little bit of near fold uh, amplification, but that wasn't the predominant period range. Uh, in terms of the general question as to how 1170 deals with it, um, I would say it's consistent with how other design codes and standards deal with it internationally, and that it uses a sort of average increase uh, due to directivity when you're not sure of the orientation of that directivity. Uh, however, it's important to distinguish between that average increase as well as the direction specific increase. So the near uh, the, the fault normal component will be quite a lot larger than that average increase uh, given by the near fault factor, whereas the fault parallel component will generally be similar to or slightly smaller uh, than that average component. So um, as always, it's a simplified uh, representation of the value. So one here, um, am I right to conclude that the basin need effect on structures is twofold, amplifications of shaking and the duration of strong shaking, um, basically a number of strong shaking cycles. So the uh, question is not directed at any one speaker in particular, um, but uh, I'm sure you might all have comments on this one. I can go first, Anna, and I'm sure you can add something. Um, yeah, I would say generally speaking that's right on the mark. It increases the amplitude and the duration. Um, and so then, depending on the type of system, will determine on how duration sensitive or how much degradation that system might have. Uh, but generally speaking, yeah, those are the two things. And Roma, have you added that one? Brenda's captured that nicely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Brenda's absolutely right. The amplification and duration are two two things to consider. I mean, when we look at spectral acceleration, there is a degree of duration that that creeps in from the way that it's calculated, but it's it doesn't capture the whole um, you know, duration picture, which is the rest to be thought about. Right, so we um, we are running kind of behind time. We're supposed to wrap up at 1.30, we're already 15 minutes beyond that. So we might have to um, to wrap things up there. Um, but thank you everyone for to keep the speakers, uh, Matt, Anna and Brendan for speaking today. Um, thanks again to the support, the support of all our, our sponsors, um, particularly EQC and MB for the um, support that you've provided to, to hold this webinar series. Um, we'll uh, continue on with the next one in a few weeks' time, and we'll be announcing that via email in the near future. So um, basically, yeah, thank you everyone for joining us over your lunch break, and um, thank you very much to the speakers for, for everything you've contributed today. So um, we'll sign off from there. and. Uh, We'll see you all again, hopefully, in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.